Hey, hey, welcome to the show. I'm your host, Una Duncan, and today I have not one, but two guests for you. That's right. It's a bit of an audio threesome up in here, and guess what? That's the first of about a million times we are going to say threesome today, because today we are talking about how to have more lovers, specifically in the context of an open or polyamorous relationship. And parents, you can take that as your cue to put the headphones on, as this will be an adult conversation. The experts today are Tara Lynn Franco. She is a relationship and awesomeness coach who helps individuals and couples explore and work through issues related to non-monogamy and other aspects of their gender, sexual, or relational identity. And Andre Turcott is a sex-positive registered psychotherapist who has been in practice for over 15 years with a focus on helping people in the queer and polyamorous communities. Together, Tara and Andre are the co-founders of TNA Coaching and Therapy. See what they did there? And their free online community is called Let's Talk Polyamory. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. You are about to learn what the difference is between polyamory, open relationships, and swinging. You're going to learn the things that everyone gets wrong about open relationships. You're also going to learn the essential acronym for all the stuff that you've got to cover before you start having sex with someone new, what to do about jealousy, and how to get started if you're looking to open up your relationship or just open up your mind to the idea of having many loves. Let's go. Ready to break up with your bullshit? I mean, all those excuses that are keeping you stuck. Because you have one life to live. And if you're not having fun yet, then that's a problem, dude. Welcome to Goals, Grit, and Some Woo Woo Shit. The podcast where you learn about the habits of kicking ass at life. Whether you want to get ripped, get rich, or just get high on life, this is the place to be. Here's your host, best-selling author and feel-good expert, Una Duncan. Taryn, Andre, I am so relieved to have you guys here. And I'll tell you why. Because I think in one of my podcast intros, it says that I will help people with their goal of having a sexy threesome on the beach. And so far, like none of my podcast guests have been forthcoming with that information. Yeah, right. Mm. So I'm hoping that you guys can help us out with that. Okay, maybe. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Any way we can would be our pleasure for sure. Perfect. So with that context, will you tell listeners a little bit about what you do? Sure. Andre and I, during COVID, actually, we started an online community called Let's Talk Polyamory as a way of not just helping people get sexy threesomes on the beach, but to educate people and help people navigate and open up an existing relationship or move into areas where they want to explore multiple relationships with others. So we started an online community to share free resources, but we also teach this and have a group program where we tell people exactly how to do this and how to manifest this for themselves while dealing with all the sort of gritty things that come up along the way. And Andre, do I understand that your background is as a relationship therapist? Yeah, I'm a psychotherapist and I move towards being a sex positive psychotherapist. And what that means for me is that I try to promote and normalize all things sexual in our identity with consent, obviously, but that we should see it as a human experience that exists. And we could look at it without any type of moral judgment because there's so much shame, unfortunately, associated with human identity and expression and relation. And it shouldn't be that way. It is by all means, quite natural. It's only the attachment that we put to it, right? Uh, It's unfortunate how the word gun or war is never edited, but sex Mm. has become now something that could be edited. It's perverse, right? And yet Mm -hmm. uh, we are called perverse. And we own that, right? We like to think of we're perverted. (laughs) I I love that. In some fun ways. In some fun ways. But it shouldn't be stigmatized Our sexual identities, our expressions, the way we relate with each other should be acceptable. We're not saying that other people have to live this way, but we should certainly be allowed to express ourselves this way. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the stigma later, but it's funny when you mentioned that there's so many times I've been watching a movie with my kids who are 10 and 12 years old and it'll be like, warning, there's going to be some boobs in this movie. And meanwhile, Mm -hmm. they've already like watched movies where people are blown up and that's, there's no warnings about that. That's just normal. People getting mm-hmm. shot, no problem, but don't show a breast. I think that's ridiculous. And I agree with you on that. 
you're talking about all the different spectrum of sexuality and how we should have no shame about being anywhere on that spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to just get some definitions from you guys. So we know we're talking about the same thing. So what is the difference between polyamory, ethical non-monogamy, open relationships and swinging? Are they all the same thing? No, <laughs> it depends on who you ask, though, I would say and I would say that most people have different definitions of mm-hmm. all these things. I would say that ethical non-monogamy or consensual non-monogamy is like the umbrella term that's over overarching everything. So anything that goes beyond having one partner, two people together as a unit monogamy mm-hmm. and there's no other people involved, whereas non-monogamy. And consensual non-monogamy or ethical non-monogamy brings in the idea that there may be multiple people involved in the relationship, but it's consenting or done in an ethical and open way. And then if you then go, and this is, we just actually did a talk about this at a local sex club, the different types of like ways to relate as non-monogamous, anywhere from monogamish, which you might have heard Dan Savage talks about being monogamish all the way to what's called relationship anarchy, where it completely breaks down the definition of relationships. But open relationship is usually referred to when you're in a committed relationship with somebody and you've decided to open it up to other partners. So you may have relationships with other people individually. But it is opened by both people consenting to it. It's it. not open just on one side because I used to have open relationships like that and I was uh, <laughs> not very honest. Yeah. So this changes it entirely. It makes it ethical. Hmm. You and can it- consent to whether or not you want to be in this kind of relationship. Exactly. Yeah. And then the difference between, say, open relationship and swinger is swinger usually refers to when there's a committed relationship, there's some emotional and sexual exclusivity, except that you may on occasion go out to a sex club or engage in threesomes or do that sort of activity, but usually together in the same place. And it's very situational. And then polyamory Mm -hmm. goes beyond the open relationship idea where you're actually having multiple loving ongoing relationships with people individually and you start to get away from that emotional and sexual exclusivity so you might not have a primary partner you may have multiple partners that you are equal in some way does that help thank you for that totally helpful i have one more definition to ask you about what is unicorn hunting and why does it piss off the poly community it doesn't there are some people that are willingly wanting to call themselves unicorns and they see nothing wrong with being hunted. In fact, they will encourage it and want it. The unicorn in this context. Let's explain with that. So a unicorn (laughs) is usually, and we're saying, I'm saying usually because we're really generalizing this. It's usually a female a person, woman identifying person who's bisexual, who may be brought into a relationship with a couple. So often a normally heterosexual couple and they're brought in as a third or an extra. And the reason why people have a hard time with it is because it it can be done in a way where the couple really acts as a we and the person is really their needs and things are secondary to the couple. So there's an idea that's called couples privilege that can come into play. And so that's why it can be frowned upon in that context. Hey, dude, if you are enjoying this episode and you have a friend that you think might also benefit from this information, please share it with them. That helps my podcast so much and it's going to help your friend. Share the love. Thanks so much. It's like the unicorn might be exploited in this context of couple privilege. Is that the idea? Yeah, precisely. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for all those definitions. And now I wonder if we can back up a little bit and you can tell us a little bit about your journeys. Were you guys a monogamous or monogamish couple beforehand and then you opened up or did you guys find each other within the polyamorous community? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. <laughs> we were, you should. I think he tells the story way better than me. Yeah. Uh, so we had, uh, <laughs> I had come out of a long-term relationship and I was enjoying my freedom, shall we say. 
So I wasn't looking to rush onto the relationship escalator, but it seems to often be the track. Anyway, Tara and I were just starting to see each other. We hadn't announced whether we wanted to become exclusive or what we were going to do, be open, any of it. It was not discussed. Yeah, not discussed. The early stages of dating. Yeah, the early stages. Sure. Of dating. We're not talking about things. Yeah. yeah it was just It was unfolding. Yeah, unfolding. <laughs> but rather early into the relationship, we were doing what we do and we were <laughs> at play in a rather complicated position. And I said, it would be really good if I had an extra set of hands. To which she responded, wow, that'd be hot. And I was like, wow, you really think so? And she said, yes. After we did what we were doing, we jumped to it and we made ourselves a profile and we started, we didn't know at the time, but we started unicorn hunting. We were right. out looking for somebody to join us in this great revelation. We executed our plan and the rest is history. So we started together, like we opened up together. Mm -hmm. Before this, I hadn't been in a non-monogamous relationship. I would have identified as someone who was monogamous and looking for a committed, ongoing partner. Yeah, you know what's funny? What strikes me, a lot of things strike me about that story, but the, one of the things is that, <laughs> is that what seemed like a good idea in that moment, in that position, also seems like a good idea after. And yeah. A couple of weeks after. And your other part, did they know about the plan? Did they know about Tara? What was that deal? Yeah. In fact, we still have an ongoing relationship six years later. And it is a very deep, open, loving relationship. And at one point, the three of us were living here. At that moment, it fulfilled one of my fantasies, which was to have a kitchen table. Not so much that we'd be in a threesome, but that we could all have a seat at the table. We could all be just welcomed and acknowledged and create community. Mm -hmm. yeah. Got it. When you first said kitchen table, I was like, is that a sex thing I don't know about? No, I got uh, it. It's actually a term. Kitchen table polyamory is when oh. everybody can, all the partners, all your partners feel comfortable sitting around a dinner table, for example. So everybody knows everybody because it's not always the case depending on how you've set up your agreements with your partners. You may not want to meet what you call your metas, your partners, partners, metamors. So metamors, I've never heard metamor. of that. So my other friend, they become Tara's meta. Metamor. Or each okay. other's metamors. Is there expected Partner to be a relationship partner. between the two of them or not necessarily? No, it could be anything from never wanting to make contact with them to becoming their own relationship, their own best friends, whatever they might be. Mm. And so, sometimes this actually causes a sticking point between people in relationships because people sometimes want to know their metamors or they don't. And then it can become a point of contention because it can be a requirement that someone doesn't want to fulfill sort of thing. So it's, it differs between people. These are the kinds of conversations that you have to have and things that people need to do when they decide to embark on consensual non-monogamy yeah. is how we're going to actually relate to each other. In the beginning, so many people... I think, and from what I've heard, they imagine that it's going to be primarily about sex. And it's not. It's about communication. <laughs> and if you communicate well, then it'll be about sex. But you have to be able to communicate. <laughs> that um, is the basis for all that. When and if there are things like Tara mentioned, a scenario like that, the only way that you're going to be able to come to any kind of sustainable agreement is by communication. So I knew a thruple once. It was a man who was with two gorgeous women. And so every time people would find out about them, they would always say to him, Oh my gosh, you're so lucky. <laughs> to which he would always respond, I am absolutely so lucky. I have two wonderful women in my life. And it's a lot of work. So I wondered if you could speak to what is the the work and the grit that is involved in this that people might not think of when they first start a unicorn hunt or whatever. <laughs> Great question. Yeah. I think that's the thing. When you first come up with this idea, you're like, oh, it's going to be so great. We're going to have all these <laughs> sexual partners. It's going to be like, wow, the experiences, the things I'm going to try. And it, and it we've is. We've had a hell of a time. But and anyway. sometimes you get this initial like bump of like excitement. And then sometimes the reality hits in because when we're often thinking about this, I'm guilty of this from when we first started is like, you're like, yeah, you get in your head and go, 
oh, I'm going to be able to do these things. But then you're not thinking about, oh, your partner, oh, they're also doing these things. And there's going to be other people in their sphere of influence. So the kind of grit things that you have to kind of face up to are, there's a few things. Some of it is your own internal insecurities and your own security, security in self, but security in your relationship. That's one of the big things. Yeah, for sure. We look at attachment styles, for example, right? And the languages that make us safe or feel insecure, we explore all that to inform ourselves because it's going to influence how we're going to receive the jealousy. So we may be already prone to fits of jealousy, even if we are in a closed relationship, like a marriage with a marriage contract, we might still be a jealous person. Mm-hmm. It's not about the action that's going to happen. It's not about whether or not the person tells us they love us or not, it's about our own internal dialogue. Do we believe it or not? Mm -hmm. The reason we talk about attachment, it sounds like very dull and boring and very theoretical, but it's because when you open an existing... Sounds very interesting. It is very interesting. (laughs) To a relationship therapist, yes. (laughs) But I think the important part about it is what people don't realize is that when you open up an existing relationship, some of your security in that relationship is tied to the structure. So now when you open up a relationship, you have to rely on all the other things to create that security in your relationship. So we talked about communication and how important that is and being super open about your communication about what you want, what you need, what you're concerned about, what your fears are, what your dreams are, all those things. The other piece, the thing that people have to work out as well that they sometimes miss is the part about getting clear on exactly why you're doing this and how it's going to actually work. Because people often open up and they miss a whole bunch of steps of like actually talking about how do we want this to actually work? And then the other part that is often missed is Let's talk about, okay, what sorts of things do we need to have in place to feel secure in this relationship? What types of agreements? Because they'll typically say, oh, in order to not feel jealous, I need to meet all your partners or I have to have the ability that people set up some crazy rules. I need to be able to veto. He makes me uncomfortable. Oh, that Una, she's gorgeous. She's too hot. You can't date her. Sorry. She's out. A common problem. Yeah. Common problem that comes up. (laughs) (laughs) So you come face to face, I think, with things that you haven't really, you might have ignored in your monogamous situation, like insecurities and self. So in that way, do you think that opening up a relationship like this, it can actually be really beneficial for a relationship because all this stuff comes to the forefront and you have to figure out how to feel secure without just it being because you have to stay together? Without a doubt. Very often I find that What's happened, because it is so honest, it allows you to announce those positions, right? Your real feelings about it, but also through your demonstrations. So here we are, we're really looking at the opportunity to be with somebody else. And if that person comes back to you, it's not because there's an obligation in front of them. It's because they want to be with you. Mm -hmm. The relationship Mm -hmm. feels good to them. There's a reason why they're there. Yeah. So in so many ways, it can be very like renewing, very affirming because you're Mm -hmm. choosing your partners over and over again. Like they don't have to come back to you. They have other people that are in the mix. Um, And it's also a crazy phenomenon (laughs) that we discovered early on is we would go to these parties, we'd go to these clubs, we'd go to these dates, whatever it was. And then we'd come home and we had such heat for each other. Mm -hmm. We'd have an incredible connection, desire for each other. I thought it was quite interesting, remarkable. But to your point, I think like for me, I think this is the most communicative, supported, secure Mm. relationship I've ever, an honest relationship I've ever been in. Yes. Like any, I think it's actually made a stronger relationship, Mm. which blows people's minds because they just don't understand how that's possible, but it is. Yeah. And it's not exclusive to the two of us, right? Many people in there have very strong, loving, open, lasting relationships. Yeah. It's interesting. Very often, people who are mm-hmm. not subscribing to poly, who are mono, will say, I want a serious relationship. We have a fairly serious relationship, <laughs> and uh, it seems long-lasting, long-term as well. Hmm. You're trying to say serious does not mean monogamous. It exists in a, in a variety of ways, a flavor for everyone. <laughs> 
This podcast is made possible by Fit Feels Good, my online fitness and nutrition company. Here's what we do. I have so many incredible benefits from the MFA program. It literally changed my life. I have the book, Healthy AF. I'm absolutely in love with my life now. I find that the healthy habits that I built are amazing to go back to. The benefits that you're going to see as a woman in your 40s plus are things you could have never imagined. The key, which I know Una talks about over and over again, is loving your body now, not what you're envisioning it to be. Hey, hey, if you're liking this podcast, you might also like my book, Healthy as Fuck. It's an international bestseller and available wherever books are sold. The audiobook is especially awesome, if I do say so myself. And if you go to fitfeelsgood.com slash healthy AF, I've got a ton of free bonuses for book readers. So make sure you go and grab those. Okay, back to the episode. So I was researching for this interview and I came across the top 10 erroneous beliefs about polyamory. Oh. And you've already addressed one of them, which is polyamorous people don't get jealous. And you're saying that's not the case. Yeah. You just oh, yeah. have to you have to deal with it. I was a very jealous person at one point, And we've, we've been able to explore that, unpack it. And my position has changed considerably. Would you say working through that jealousy has had other benefits in your life other mm-hmm. than now you guys both get to have sex with other people? No doubt. In, in another way, which was already known to me, but you could uh, argue that it shows you that you have emotional regulation ability, right? You can manage your feelings. They're not the master of you. You are the master of them. That's pretty powerful. Yes, um, it is. I can see when you guys are talking about the amount of communication and the amount of security that you have to build in order for this to work. And you said it did make you hot for each other when you're also having these other loving relationships. Although one of the top 10 things people get wrong about polyamory is that it can save a relationship that's on the rocks. No. What would you guys say if a (laughs) couple comes to you who is mono, who's maybe not doing so well, and they're like, I have an idea. Let's throw five other people in this mix. Yeah, I would say that throwing five people in the mix right away is probably not your first step. If it's something that you've always wanted to explore, maybe, but I think that you have to work on the foundational elements first. It's not going to it's not going to save your relationship, I don't think. If you have other problems already, it's not going to fix them. It will magnify <laughs> the good or the bad. I think it really brings mm. to the forefront a lot of very intense feelings. So yeah, I think it's obviously indicating that we should have a more secure base before venturing into it. That being said, if we do have good patterns of communication, then if we are in agreement, let's be curious about it. So another one of those misunderstood things about polyamory is that it's bad for kids, that it sets a bad example if the couple has kids. And I wonder if you'd speak to that. Yeah, that's an interesting one. We definitely know a lot of people who have kids and are polyamorous. I think it's like anything. It's how it's positioned with the kids, how you introduce people, what involvement they have in their life. And kids are really good at normalizing those things. I think the important part is just not to put kids, I think it's age dependent, right? What to introduce at certain ages, I think you have to be considerate of. Would well, you agree? Yeah, but that goes with being mono or poly, right? <laughs> As consenting adults, we're not going to have sex in front of kids, whether we are <laughs> married or not, whether we are poly or not, right? Mm. It's just some things are appropriate, some things are not. But whether we relate to one person or a couple people one way or another is in no way what is threatening. It's how we determine it to be. So if we make it covert and we make it seem as though it's something that has to be hushed up as though it is in any way prohibited or immoral or corrupt, then it will be seen that way. But if we bring it to the forefront and normalize it and say, this is the way that some people like to interact, then it seems as though it is quite okay. One of many options. So how are we going to introduce it to the next generation? And the next generation already the kids in their 20s, they think that it's perfectly a <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I wonder if it's really less about the kids and more about how we are with it. Mm. I worked with a couple and part of what they did during our time together was they came out to their kids. And they wanted to do that. And their kids are varying ages. They have several of them. And 
they spoke to them differently about what it was, but how they introduced it was, is that their mom and dad have other friends. And so the kids didn't question when they went out, dad disappeared overnight, like, where did he go? That sort of thing. So it, cause kids can make up stories as well, just like adults, right? So if you're actually honest with the kids, it actually serves them better rather than trying mm. to hide and keep things a secret. I agree. It's not the act of being with somebody in that case, right? If the kids find out, it's that they lied. It becomes a trust issue. That's why we really try to advocate for transparency, that it should be within reason appropriate, but that it should be ethical in that sense. Andre, you mentioned that the younger generation don't have a problem with it, but there are some people older or conservative leaning that would have a problem with this. So what I wanted to ask you guys about the stigma and about being out so I have a friend who is polyamorous who is out personally, but not professionally, mm-hmm. because she's pretty sure she will lose clients. And I'm wondering, how do you coach your clients in helping them decide whether to come out, how much to come out? Yeah, that's a great question. First of all, I need to put that big asterisk to what I said earlier, right? When I say the younger generation, by all means, it doesn't mean everybody. There's lots of young of people that are not in favor of that. They wanted more traditional conventional, and that's perfectly fine as well. Um, As far as moving that needle now, it's on a case-by-case basis, right? If you really feel as though it's not appropriate for you to come out, if there are going to be implications or consequences that aren't going to serve you or your family, then by all means, do what you feel you must do. I happen to be in a very interesting position that I am of my own private practice, and I answer to only myself in a sense. So I am free to stand on the soapbox and announce myself. But I would never out anybody. And if they are in a situation, whether it's part of their belief system or their employment or their family, whatever it might be, they have to listen to their own feelings and do what is right and comfortable for them. But that being said, <laughs> I invite people to come with me, come stand together, because in time, it'll be so normalized. It'll be like, big deal. So what? And what of it? If that's what we're wanting. Yeah, I think it's a personal decision. Like for me, Mm -hmm. when I started coaching, I felt at first I was being very hidden about the fact that I was supporting people specifically who were non-monogamous. So I was not putting anything on my Instagram page. I wasn't putting anything on LinkedIn. I was very much hiding it. And then I decided this is crazy. Like I can't do this. I don't want to be hidden. It's not doesn't align with my values. Mm. And so I went through an entire process of coming out to my family first. And then I just now I'm just out completely. In fact, even today, I was working with somebody. And I was like, I just told that guy that I'm a relationship coach. And I specialize in people who are non monogamous. And I was like, felt so good about doing that. And he was like, that's so cool. Yeah, I bet people need help with that. And then like next on to the next thing. It was a total non issue. Yeah. But I think it's hard. It's a yeah. hard thing to come out in the workplace. I I don't go announcing it to the rooftops. Mm-hmm. If somebody asks me or inquires, I don't hide. But it can be very difficult for many people. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, it's still that way. And if it is difficult for you, then please feel free to contact us. But <laughs> if we feel as though we're not able to announce a position and it's having impact on us, then by all means, talk about it and find ways to come to terms with that. Because I wonder, maybe Tara, especially for you, I'm not sure you guys correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I feel like Tara, if you went around saying that, would there be an assumption that she's just sexually available, period? Probably. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I've spoken to quite a few women. It makes me think back to the uh, dating sites, right? Mm -hmm. On many profiles, many women are reluctant to announce that they're polyamorous because then they get flooded with their inbox. I'm sorry. I totally answered for you. That's okay. (laughs) But I think also to the other side of that, I've heard from a lot of men that if they put that they are Mm -hmm. open or polyamorous, then it's often received as though they're only wanting sex when they might want a loving ongoing polyamorous relationship. I like to use it as an opportunity. And this is what I would tell people who are like thinking about coming out to family or friends or whomever is like, talking about why it's important to you. And that's what I did when I came out to my Mm. parents. It's dispelling that myth that it's just about having a bunch of sex. And maybe, maybe that was part of the initial like appeal to it. But if you ask me today, I'll tell you today is it's that Mm. I'm able to have such amazing, close, intimate, loving relationships with so many people that I wouldn't have had in, if I had stayed monogamous. I don't think so. And it's different mm. than friendships. 
if anybody asks or if anybody alludes to that, I was like, yeah, sex is great. Don't get me wrong. But here's what I love about being polyamorous and how much it enriches my life. And when you guys came out to your families and friends, and now you're completely out, did you did you have anyone who gave you a hard time or misunderstood? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, my family had a really hard time with it. In fact, it was a very, I think I came out in April 2021. And we're still I feel like I'm still in the process of working through that. It was almost like, they have to meet you anew because they everything they mm. believed about you is all of a sudden changed. And then this idea of being non-monogamous like overcomes everything else. Like you're a totally different person and they don't get it. It's against what they think. They ask themselves what they did wrong. What are people going to say? Like all this stuff. And it was really hard. Like my dad didn't talk to me. For a while, I, my mom was the only one that would talk to me on the phone. I wasn't going to family events. Like, it was major. And then over time, continuing to talk to them and that sort of thing, it's gotten better. But it's like they had to relearn that I'm still, like, everything else that they knew about me was the same. Like, I'm the same person inside. I just have this other part of me that is maybe different than that. what they would do for themselves. So yeah, it was a big, it was a big, it was a big thing. My sister too. My sister didn't want the kids to come and hang out with me in Toronto because she was worried that they were going to be exposed to friends of mine. Like, it's so interesting. Yet I had my 50th birthday in July and those same friends that I have sex with sometimes, but are also my very close loving friends came to my party and my family met them and they're normal people. <laughs> They're not yeah. these like monsters that you imagine them to be. Did you want to answer that? Just what it was like for me coming out to my family. One remark that I got from somebody is they're trying to wrap their head around the idea of our being in an open relationship. And they're like, somebody said, let me get this straight. You're allowed to cheat on them. That is a very different response than what Tara got. Yeah. But it was the idea that the only way it could be permissible would be through cheating, which is what was familiar to us, right? So yeah, that's unfortunate. Or but, that you're allowing Tara to have other partners. Well, that's the, the other th one. Th that was the second thought. That <laughs> once they realized that they would be able to do that, I informed them that it's reciprocal, right? Yeah, I think they were a little bit more surprised at that. That, that was their objection. So interesting yeah. how the societal boundaries are so different for the female partner. Yeah, yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, without a doubt. Okay, now I want to take you guys back to the beginning when you decided to go unicorn hunting. So this is where everyone's like, wait, you still haven't told us how to find <laughs> a, a love, an extra lover. So tell us about that. Where did you go to find the unicorn? Were you successful? And where would one go today if they were interested in exploring It's this? kind of embarrassing now. I'm like, were we really unicorn hunting? I guess we were because we didn't know any better. But what we did was we just went on one of the standard apps and we did the thing which we tell people never to do now, which is we created a joint profile and which we both had access to. And then we just started seeking people out. So the reason I say I wouldn't suggest that is because the people we spoke to didn't necessarily know that they, who they were speaking to, which I think is not great. Mm. But we just started putting things out there and we started talking with some people and then we met people for a drink, just like you would a normal date. And then talked about what they wanted, what we wanted. And then we had several threesomes at the beginning. That's really how we started. And yeah. we're actually still friends with a couple of yeah, them sure. too. Uh, threesomes are like the gateway to open relationships. But it is something like to see your partner having sex with someone in front of you for the very first time. It's definitely something that you can't unsee. It's just like going to a sex club for the first time. So for some people, if they want to get warmed up to this and aren't ready to put their self, put themselves on a dating site and start meeting people, mm -hmm. they could go to, there's all kinds of lifestyle clubs all over the world that you can go to and you can just go and observe and see what's going on and test it out. But there's... But you could ask yourself, where on that spectrum do you fall? So are you looking for something in a club like that's more sexual and less emotional? Or would you prefer to start with something that's a little bit more emotional and then perhaps sexual? So if you wanted something more emotional, then make yourself you would just put yourself on a regular 
dating yeah. app and then say, oh, by the way, I'm also in a committed relationship, you know, a, but it's a open. lot of the sites. There's some sites that are specific to people already in this who are familiar okay. with this. But on the mainstream sites, a lot of those mainstream sites now are giving you the option if you're looking for something casual, are you looking for monogamy, are you looking for, and it will give you that option. But a lot of people will even put it out there. They might say, looking for somebody open-minded, which means you're open nah. to, let's see how it goes. Hmm. Right? So right. there's de dating sites, there's clubs, but there's right. also things depending on what you're interested in. If you're interested in something more like Dom, Sub, BDSM types of things, there's lots of groups mm -hmm. out there that have what they call munches. And you can go to an event, which is a social event, and they have it in the poly community too, yeah. where you basically go. It's not a sexual event. You just go and you meet people over like a beer or a drink or something like that. And you just talk and meet people. So it's takes off the pressure, the mm. sex pressure, but gets you to meet people and get into those environments. And then you mentioned when you hook up with these people, you'll meet for a drink, and you'll talk about what you want. I wanted to share with you an acronym that someone told me about what they go through as far as the talk before they are going to have sex with okay. someone. You might have heard this. this might be in the poly community, but I want to share it with you if, in case you hadn't. So the acronym is RATS ASS. Oh. And so the R is for relationship status. Okay. What's your relationship status? A, avoid. Is there anything you don't want to do? Oh. T, turn ons. Tell us, tell me what you do want to do. S is for STIs. Mm -hmm. So what kind of protection are we talking about? When did you get last tested? A is for aftercare. What kind of aftercare do you require? Mm -hmm. Do you want to cuddle? Do you need a text the next morning? Like what, what do you need for aftercare? And then S is for sharing. Who can I share this with? And S is for secrets. Who do you not want me to tell about Ooh. this? I like that acronym. That That's good? pretty awesome. Uh I love the rat's ass because yeah. really what it's doing is it's opening up the channels of communication, right? So it's giving us an opportunity to announce these things and to find out, are there any red flags? Are What are our preferences? Yeah. And one of the things we, cool. always, you like we always do is to have the S, the STI conversation that always happens right. before the first date, in-person date or on text or when was the last time? What's your history of testing? Like how often mm -hmm. you get tested? When was the last mm -hmm. time you got tested? How often do you use protection? Do you always use protection? We want to normalize discussions of STI. We talk about community. It's also a community where we have to talk about STIs. We maybe in our tennis community, it's not going to be an issue, but here it is. So we talk about this in a very normalized way. And again, without any attachment of moral judgment. If we were catching a cold, a flu, we're not going to assign any kind of moral judgment. We don't think you're a bad person because you have the flu. If you had gonorrhea or chlamydia or anything else, you're not a bad person by having that. It's a virus that's gone around and you've caught it. So what we have to do is we have to do the responsible thing. We shut down all sexual activity. We go to our doctor. We get the prescribed medication. We follow the protocol. And then once we are tested to be clear, then we reintegrate into the system. But we must be conscious of how we interact with each other mm -hmm. as a community. So we act responsibly and accordingly. But part of it starts with a regular testing and talking about it, the conversation of normalization. Like you started all this by saying you have to have amazing communication about emotions, <laughs> but you also have to have amazing communication about your physical self because it's a physical thing yeah. you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. It's even having communication about hygiene, for example, we have to be able to tell each other all these things. <laughs> but that's a hard thing. Like I know at the beginning, it was hard to do that because you're not used to having those conversations with people because it's, oh, I'm talking to this person like in the first few texts and I'm like, so what, what's your STI testing protocol? Yeah. But I've totally gotten used to it and people often just offer. So sometimes that's a way mm. of doing it as well. It's just offering. I was last tested this day. I get tested and as soon as I Every three mm -hmm. months, for or example. Or every new partner, or mm -hmm. whatever is. And getting tested is wonderful, but it is a snapshot at that moment in time. So as soon as you introduce another variable, that last test is obsolete, right? Mm -hmm. We have to wrap up, but I want to wrap up on something a little sexier yeah, yeah. than STIs. Right. So, <laughs> do you have any final words for people who are curious about this and uh, would want to learn more? Yeah. Okay. Start talking about it. Do some research. Think about what it is that you want. Like, what do you desire? What are you interested in? Have like a vision. Do your vision of 
What would be exciting? What goals do I want to have? And then you can start the plan of How do I go about and get that? And of course, like we're a great resource for that. We have a whole online community people can join where we share all kinds of resources on how to meet people, what to do when you're feeling jealous, how to communicate, all those things. And yeah, just go out and inform yourself and talk to your partners if you have a partner. Yeah. And trust your instinct, trust your feelings, be safe about it, but go to it with an open, loving heart. And if it's not for you, that's fine. But if it is, Fantastic. And then know that your first experience of it might not be your fi- your final destination. There are things, there's grit that you need to work through, yeah. but it's all figure outable. And with the right supports, the right desire to do it, that it's all possible. Like it's not to limit yourself because, oh, I've always been a jealous person. You know what I mean? To be open to the fact that there's a great opportunity to grow as a person and learn more about yourself. Even if in the end you figure out it's not for you, you've done that, had that experience, which I think is awesome. That's so well said. That, that's what <laughs> I wanted to say. That's excellent. <laughs> and you know what? It's so in alignment with all the goals we talk about on this podcast with any goal it is going to require a little bit of grit. It's going to require some failing and figuring it out. And then you transform all of that. This conversation has been so fascinating. I'm definitely going to leave in the podcast notes, the link for your community, for your website, so people can get in touch with you Mm -hmm. there. And uh, I really, I'm so grateful you guys came on the show. Thank you so much for having us. Yes. Thank you. And go have those threesomes on the beach. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, my guess is that you listened to that and maybe you had a really strong reaction. Maybe you were like, giddy up, that sounds like fun. Or maybe you were like, hell no on the polyamory. Either way, I just want to point out a few ways that this goal to have many loves and explore ethical non-monogamy is just like any goal you might have. For one, it often starts with curiosity. I wonder what it would be like to do this. I wonder if I could pull this off. It's like the hero's call to adventure in the hero's journey archetype. And then often there's a lot of people who think you can't or you shouldn't do it. And that goes for starting a business, for opening up your relationship, for getting super ripped, for taking a year off to travel the world or whatever your big goal is. And then you're going to face obstacles. And often those obstacles will dredge up all of your insecurities and your weak spots and your character flaws. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the endeavor, that your goal isn't a good fit for you. It's more of an invitation to work on those things and come out the other side a better person. See, and you thought it was just all about sex. Well, Here's your chance to stop being such a pervert and leave me a review. Hey, dude, thanks for listening. If you like this episode, make sure you're subscribed so you can get the next one. And by the way, if you rate and review this podcast, it really helps me get found by other people who need some goals, grit, and some woo-woo shit. And be sure to connect and DM me at Una Duncan on Instagram and let me know what you thought of the episode. Chat soon.